Well, as you've already heard this evening, we're looking at the perfect example of humility, what it is that uh, we are called to imitate, what we are called to emulate, and that is the example of Jesus Christ. And I think as we think about the humiliation of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by humiliation, we don't mean in the sense that He had pie in His face or anything like that, but that He was willing to humble Himself to the point even uh, of death on the cross. So let's read about his humiliation in Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11. Again, I'm sure you're, if you weren't already aware that this is our text, if you know the Scriptures very well, you know that this is probably the best exposition of what our Lord Jesus did. And by the way, this is also one of the clearest passages that tells us that Jesus Christ is God as well as man. Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although He existed in the form of God did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May the Lord bless His Word to our understanding uh, this evening, and may He give us the grace to follow this example. Now, remember this morning we saw an example of what we are not to be. Uh, the Lord gave us a perfect example of that as well because of the corruption of the Jewish leaders. Remember, Jesus warned them that their time was coming to an end. He cleansed God's temple of their presence because of their corruption. He cursed the fig tree to show what it was that was about to come on Israel for their disobedience. He told them the kingdom was going to be taken away from them that they would be destroyed and their city would be set on fire, which is exactly what happened. While others would take their place, um, not only possessing the kingdom of heaven through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they would also take the place of those who were originally invited to the wedding feast that God had prepared for His Son. They rejected His Son and so they were rejected from the table. Instead, those who trusted the Lord Jesus came to that table and enjoyed that celebration, and we continue to do so today. But why did all these things come on them? Why were they cursed in this way? Well, it's for at least two reasons, as we saw this morning. Of course, there were many others, but the two we looked at were their hypocrisy. Because of uh, what, you know, they, 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 well, they actually taught one thing and, and did another as far as changing God's law in various ways, their sin just pushed them all over the map. But it was also because of their pride. Perhaps one thing as we've seen that's singled out in Scripture that the Lord really loves is humility, but one thing that He really hates is pride and the human race is full of it. He hates it when we try to lift ourselves up over those around us. The Lord basically tells us, as high as we try to soar, He will bring us equally low. But again, the Lord loves humility. He gives grace to the humble. 
And as low as we are willing to lower ourselves, the, the Lord tells us, to that degree He is willing to exalt us. Now this evening we have the perfect example of the one who lowered Himself the most and because He did, He was exalted to the place of highest honor in the kingdom of heaven. And that is, of course, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. One thing we do have to remember when Jesus says, who is the greatest in the kingdom? The one who humbles himself to become the servant of all, he is the greatest in the kingdom. Well, that one is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what I want us to look at this evening are basically two things. Uh, first of all, I want us to look at Jesus' example of humiliation to see just how great it was and to see what the Lord did for him because he was willing to do this. But secondly, what this calls us to do. We might say that well, we might, actually, we have to say Jesus is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, but the question is, who is going to be second? Who's going to be third? Well, it's going to be those who follow His example and who follow it the best. So first of all, let's consider Jesus' example. And to see the extent of His humiliation, we do need to remember, first of all, who it is that Jesus is, who it was that was willing to become one with us in order to save us. I mean, Jesus is really none other than God. That's what Paul tells us. He existed in the form of God. And there's really only one who does, and that is God Himself. Now, we realize that, that there are three persons in the Godhead. He is not all three persons. He is one of those persons. But as a person in the Godhead, He is fully God. Paul says that He is equal with God. But Jesus is no mere man. Jesus is God in our nature. He is basically God become a man. Now, as far as starting points go, uh, from which to humble yourself, you can't really get any higher than that. He is the Lord of all creation. He is the eternal Son of God, the one who shares all of God's attributes, the one who with the Father and the Spirit is infinitely exalted who has all glory, all honor, and all power. Now, again, Paul wants us to understand who this one is who humbled himself so that we can see the degree to which he was willing to do this. He is none other than the eternal God himself. Well, knowing how high was the starting point, uh, just how low was the Lord willing to go? Well, here again, he starts at the highest possible point. And he descends to what we've considered to be the lowest possible point, as low as he possibly could have gone. I mean, basically, he, he, he humbled himself in, oh, we might say five ways at least, that he became a man, that he took on the likeness of sinful humanity, that he was born into a poor family, that he took the role of a servant and that He was willing to serve us even to the point of becoming a curse for us on the cross. So first of all, Jesus became a man. And again, we've heard these things before, but I think it would be helpful for us to remind ourselves just what Jesus was willing to do in order to serve us. Paul says this one who is the eternal God emptied Himself. Now, He didn't empty Himself of any of His divine attributes, certainly not all of them, because He would no longer be God, but rather He emptied Himself of His glory. He emptied Himself of His honor and His reputation, <clears throat> not by really putting anything off, but rather by putting something on. He took something that was infinitely below Him, and that is a human nature, basically the Creator becomes one of his creatures. And, you know, I, I was trying to find some kind of an analogy, perhaps a different one than, uh, than we've used in the past, but I really couldn't find a better one than this. There's really no analogy that can do justice to it. But think about this, that if you were able to take another nature to yourself, in other words, join your personality to another nature besides a human nature, and you think about what is the lowest one that you possibly could join with, well, amoeba is the, the lowest I could think of, a single-cell organism. 
you wouldn't come anywhere close to what Jesus actually did in His humiliation. Because the distance between you and an amoeba is basically finite, it's limited. You know, we're, we're both creatures. But there is an infinite distance between God and His creatures or His creation or anything that God has made. When our Lord Jesus took to Himself our nature, He took things to Himself that were infinitely below what He was. For instance, the Almighty became weak. I mean, think about um, our Lord Jesus Christ was weary by the well in Samaria. The one who was omniscient became ignorant. He said, you know, that day and that hour no one knows except the Father in heaven, not the angels either. The one who is eternal and omnipresent became limited to one time and one place. The infinite became finite. And again, with regard to time, we do need to realize that the one who existed outside of time basically became limited in time. There's only one time that exists, I think. But again, He limited Himself in all these ways. So first of all, the Creator became a creature, which is an infinite condescension in and of itself. But our Lord Jesus Christ went further than this. When He became a man, the Bible says He did not take to Himself the likeness of perfect humanity. He didn't become like Adam in the garden. He did morally, but not as far as what He looked like. He took to Himself the likeness of sinful humanity, which means He looked like any one of us. Paul writes in our passage that He was made in the likeness of men, not supermen and not perfect men, but men. And Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, a little bit more specifically, what this likeness was. He says, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. Now again, consider that for the, the Creator to become a creature is an infinite condescension to begin with, even if He had become a perfect man, but He becomes one who looks like any one of us. He was basically like us in every way and liable to the same things that we are liable to in this world. The only difference is He did not have a sin nature. But He lowered Himself even further than this because He didn't become just a man or even just in the likeness of sinful man, He became a poor man. Again, I think we would admit that even if Jesus, uh, the Son of God, had come into the world as the richest and most powerful man in the world, that would be infinite condescension on His part. But that's not what He did. He was born into a family of a poor tradesman. He lived a meager life. He learned an honest but low-paying trade. And you know, our Lord Jesus Christ was 30 years old by the, before He started His ministry, which means that if He was, I imagine He was trained at a very early age to do this work, He must have been at it for over 20 years. So our Lord knows what it is to be poor. He knows what it is to work for a living because He did that. We often don't even think about what He did prior to His ministry. But He became a poor tradesman. But again, He lowered Himself even further than this because being born as a man in our image and the son of a poor carpenter, He came into this world to serve, the Bible says. Now, it's true that when He began His ministry that He did exercise a certain measure of authority. He is, after all, the Lord of, of lords. But we need to realize that He used that authority to minister. He used it to serve. He served His disciples and He served us, which is one of the reasons I think Peter had some difficulty realizing who Jesus Christ was when Jesus girded Himself with a towel and stooped to wash Peter's feet. Peter was very uncomfortable with that. But again, Jesus did not come to be served. He came to serve. He took the role of a servant. And that is, again, humiliation. That is a humbling on His part. But again, He humbled Himself even further than that to the point of death, even death on the cross. Because in His service to us, He was willing 
uh, not only to serve us as he did in teaching us and in um, you know, doing what he did as far as obedience on our part, uh, doing what we needed to do but failed to do, but he was willing even to bear our sins in his own body and to take the curse that was meant for us upon himself and to bear his father's wrath for that curse on the cross so that we might go free. Paul writes in Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Again, we think about the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, but how often do we think about the fact that in His being nailed to a cross, that that was symbolic of the fact that He had become a curse for us. As Paul writes here, it was written in the law, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing. He became a curse for us. That was our curse that He bore, but He was willing to do that. So being God, He became a poor man who looked like us with our limitations to serve us even to the point of becoming a curse for us and dying in our place. And remember the starting point. This is God who is willing to do this. Well, this is the infinite humiliation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what did the Father give Him for humbling Himself this much? Well, since he was willing to stoop the lowest, the Bible says that he was raised by his Father to the highest. God highly exalted him and gave him the name above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow to him in heaven and earth and in hell. Every tongue would confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So again, who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? Well, the greatest is the Lord Jesus Christ because He was the one who was willing to humble Himself the most. He was the one who was also exalted to the highest place. This is how God's economy works. But now the question arises, who's going to be second? Who's going to sit on His right hand and on His left? Should it matter to us? Should it matter to us what our position is in the kingdom of God? Should it matter whether, you know, we're, we're just, we just sort of get in through the door and everything that we've done just burns up or that we have something to present to the Lord, that we have some kind of honor? Isn't Jesus tell us that we should store up or lay up our treasures in heaven? I mean, what does he mean by that? Well, he means, among other things, that we need to follow his example and seek the honor that comes from God, that we need to humble ourselves and serve so that we might receive a reward. Just about every example I can think of in Scripture entails some kind of service, even the talents that were entrusted to those who, um, you know, who belong to the Lord. They went out and used them to honor the Master. They served Him with those things. So who is the one who's going to sit on His right or who is on, on His left? Well, I think according to Scripture, has to be the one who most closely follows his example. The one who humbles himself the most will be exalted the most. I mean, Paul tells us here that we are to have the same attitude in ourselves that was in the Lord Jesus Christ. And to the degree that we do that, to the degree that we humble ourselves and serve others, to that degree we will share in His glory. Now, I do think that one thing Paul tells us in in this passage that we've looked at are some helpful, practical ways that we can actually do this, although we have to admit there are many more scattered throughout Scripture. But it is interesting that the ones that he gives us here mainly have to do with imitating Jesus Christ and what he did for us, which is probably why after he tells us what to do, He says, have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ because Christ is the perfect example of what He calls us to do. So as our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to stoop so low to lift us up, 
Paul tells us that we are to stoop or to go out of our way to lift up one another, to lift up our brothers and sisters, and I think we might even say our potential brothers and sisters. And again, he gives us a list sort of at the front of this passage of different practical ways that we ought to do this. He says in verse 2, first of all, that we need to be of the same mind. Literally, we need to think the same thing. Uh, and I think that with regard to one another. We need to look at one another in a certain way. Now, it is true that some interpret this to mean that we should be of the same mind, that we should think the same thing, that is, with regard to the truth of God. Try to agree as much as possible. And certainly, I think that we ought to do that. But I think what Paul has in mind here is that we ought to have the same mind towards one another as our Lord Jesus Christ has toward us that we need to look at one another as our Lord Jesus looks at us and remember that He, I, you know, in being in Christ, He thinks well of us. And so we should think well of one another and not think less of each other. Secondly, He says we are to maintain the same love for one another. I think it's quite obvious from our, our, the example of our Lord Jesus Christ that He loves us, that He loves each and every one of His children. I mean, look at what He was willing to do for each one of us. Well, He says that you are to love one another, even as He has loved you. Maintain the same love for one another, especially those who are in uh, this particular uh, fellowship, this particular communion of believers, but also to those from other communions outside of this particular church. If they are the Lord's, then you are to love them. Thirdly, he says that we are to be united in spirit with our brothers and sisters, to be harmonious, to be as one, again, having a similar attitude towards one another, the same as our Lord Jesus Christ had. He says you are to be intent on one purpose, and I think that one purpose, of course, is giving glory to God. If there's any one thing that unites a people, any society, it's having a common goal, right? Right? If you're all striving after the same thing, you, you close ranks and you work together. Well, the Lord tells us that we need to have one purpose. We need to have a common goal that's going to unite us together. And it has to be the same goal that our Lord Jesus Christ had, and that is promoting the work of the gospel, glorifying the Father, and in our case, of course, glorifying Jesus Christ as well by taking His gospel out, by doing everything we can to advance the kingdom of heaven, which is, by His grace, what we're seeking to do, uh, better and better. He says, you are to do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, you are to regard one another as more important than yourself. I think we saw something of that in 1 Corinthians 13. Love does not brag, it's not arrogant, does not seek its own. Paul is telling us the same thing here. You need to make sure that when you do what you do, you're not just thinking about yourself. You're not just trying to promote yourself. But rather, you need to be thinking about how you might benefit your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Don't just think about yourself, think about others. And along with that, he says, not to focus on your own personal interests. That is what it is that concerns you. But rather, you are to be concerned about the interests of others. What it is your brothers and sisters are concerned about. What it is that, you know, that troubles them. Or what benefits them. Now, this last part in particular, I was thinking about this. If you don't focus on your interests, but you focus on the interests of others and you try to help them, if, if you do that, if we do that as a body, doesn't the danger exist that we're going to be doing nothing but serving while others are going to do nothing but soak in our service? I mean, the potential exists, you know, as we sort of turn our attention off of ourselves onto others. We do, of course, run into those that that like to focus on themselves. Now, that potential certainly exists unless, of course, we all strive to do this, which is what the Lord is calling us to do. So, <clears throat> one practical way, perhaps, um, that we might be able to implement some of this, because I think it culminates in this last one, 
Don't think about yourself only. Don't think about your own concerns only and your own interests. But think about the interests of others. What's a practical way that you can do that? Well, you know, sometimes I think we might tend to come to a brother or a sister and tell them about our concerns, tell them about what's troubling us, our particular problems and our particular woes so that they can minister to us. But rather than doing that, perhaps what we should do is think more like the Lord Jesus Christ who didn't have his mind set on his own interests but rather entirely upon the interests of his sheep. He was willing to do the things that we've already seen that he was willing to do so that he might serve us. Let's think about how we might serve one another. Instead of coming to others to share our woes with them so they can listen to us and they can minister to us, why don't we go to them and ask them what their concerns are, the things are that they're going through, the things that are troubling uh, them, and then seek to try to minister to them. And I believe this is what we're being told to do here both by way of Christ's example and by way of what Paul the Apostle tells us to do. I think if we do that, and you've probably heard this before, and I think it certainly is true, that if you do that, you'll probably find that whatever concerns or needs that you have will probably be more than met by the Lord Himself. When we set our own concerns aside and minister to others, the Lord ministers to us. I think He heals us in ways that we never thought possible. He helps us resolve our issues and our problems. He gives us wisdom even if nobody even speaks to us. But I think the Lord also will make sure that if we don't figure it out, He will bring somebody to minister to us. But the point is, the Lord doesn't want us to be self-centered. He wants us to be others-centered, even to the point where we might even think about others more than we think about ourselves and be more concerned for others than we are for ourselves. Again, Jesus is the perfect example because He did everything that Paul is referring to here and more, which is why he uses Him as the example. Jesus is the one who stooped the lowest in order to serve each one of us. And we have to admit, Jesus still serves us today. He's the one who is interceding for us in heaven. But again, because Jesus was willing to become a servant, He was also exalted. And if you will humble yourself and follow His example, to the degree that you do that, to that degree you will be exalted. So if you should do this better than anyone else, excepting the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, which you can never uh, ever possibly go beyond what He has done, then you will be the second greatest in the kingdom next to our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, is that going to make you uh, visible when the Lord uh, looks you know, at, at the earth as He's looking around, seeing who, who it is whose heart is completely His? That is what's going to make you stand out. The Lord is going to be able to use you. But you've got to get your eyes off yourself. You've got to get them onto the Lord and onto others. You need to forget about your pride, forget about your position, forget about trying to be someone great in the world, and instead focus on being a great servant. So let's, according to this, strive not to try to outdo one another in showing up one another with our gifts and graces, but rather, let's do what Paul tells us to do in Romans chapter 12. Try to outdo one another in showing honor to one another. This is how we become great in the kingdom of God, following the example of our Lord. So may the Lord give us the grace to do that. Let's, uh, let's spend a, a moment in prayer and ask the Lord to help us.